Well, once again, um, happy Thanksgiving to, uh, to all of you guys, whether you had your supper on like Friday, Saturday, tonight, or tomorrow. Um, thankful for you guys uh, for just being here this evening. And uh, like Pastor Jeff said, my name is Ruben. I'm um, uh, one of the pastors on staff. And, and tonight, it's going to look a little different. We don't really have a series. Uh, we've just finished Bad Church going through the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, last week and next week, we br- start a brand new series going through the Holy Spirit. And, but tonight, I, 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 I kind of want to go through a different message uh, on thankfulness and, and gratitude. And uh, this is totally, <laughs> by the, totally unrelated, but I wore this uh, outfit this morning to church. And uh, someone said, uh, I look like a turkey took a dump over a Thanksgiving clock. And uh, I decided at that moment I will never have kids. So that's that. But tonight, I want to take a look at, at a specific story and, and uh, just draw out some things and hopefully teach you some things that God has taught me about this topic. And uh, before we get into it, just to set up a little bit of context here, it's going to be on the screen if you don't have a Bible. If you do and want to follow along, we're in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, which is the, f- the fifth book in the Bible. If you do have one with you and want to follow along, we're going to be reading in chapter 8. But just a little bit of context here. Moses is, is leading um, the, the Israelites. They're moving into kind of like the next step of their journey. And um, they've been wandering the, the wilderness for about almost 40 years now, and God has promised them that they're going to be going towards a place called the promised land. And that's where they're going to finally feel at home, finally feel at rest, um, and let their guard down. And so at this point in this story, they're about three quarters of the way there, and Moses kind of gives this little pep speech towards them. And this is what it says. If you don't have one, a Bible, you can just follow along on the screen here. This is verse 7 to verse 18. It says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land of flowing streams and pools of water with fountains and springs that gush out into valleys and hills. It is a land of wheat and barley, of grapevines, fig, fig trees, and pomegranates, of olive oil and honey. It is a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It is a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is abundant in the hills. When you have eaten, though, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. But that is a time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees that I'm giving you today. For when you become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not be Come proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Do not forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions where it was hot and dry. He gave you water even from the rock. He fed you with manna, which is a type of bread, in the wilderness of food unknown to your ancestors. He did this, why? To humble you and test you for your own good. He did all of this so you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Remember, remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. See, in this moment, in this specific story and chapter and book of the Bible, we see here, like I mentioned before, their honor journey. Moses is leading his nation towards what God's next for them. And at this point in time, God's next for them is achieving um, home and residence in the promised land. And in this, in this story, this little speech he gave here, he's giving both this kind of encouragement that the end is near, but also reminds you that, hey, don't forget who brought you towards the end. He knows because over the last 40 years um, that he's led his country, the Israelites have become mm, very picky and let their preference take over whatever God has provided to them. In this case, it was more food and water. Moses is kind of like training and teaching and raising little toddlers. And so he's reminding his own country, his own nation, listen, what's going to be happening, what you're going to get is magnificent. And, uses, and using Moses' language here, he calls it blessings. And even though you're holding on to these blessings, do not forget the provider of these blessings. And why do I say this? Because we have to understand and realize tonight that God's gifts alone don't really bring full joy and full fulfillment. It's a crazy thing to think about, but actually what brings full joy and full fulfillment is when you let God's blessings And your gratitude and thankfulness and acknowledgement be paired towards together. 
Because like, if, if we miss the provisions and blessings from God, our hearts could grow cold, and our hearts could turn prideful, and we will eventually miss out on the opportunities the Christian life will present towards you. And your life will never be able to kind of like fully enjoy and take residence in that true, deep sense of joy. Because if you grow in gifts and things, but not in gratitude, what truly have you gained? The University of Indiana did several studies and surveys with over 100,000 people in the States. And uh, I don't think the results will shock you um, compared to the Canadian context. And so they discovered in our society in 2019, so this was pre-pandemic, but as a matter of fact, I would think this list becomes a little worse. They said and concluded that they are living in the midst of people who have decreased happiness, increased chances of depression, decreased well-being, increased feelings of stress and anxiety, decreased social satisfaction, increased loneliness, decreased level of satisfaction, and increased, increased chances of frustration. And the leading mental health psychologist there at the University of Indiana, his name is Dr. Joel Wong, he stated that implementing actually simple practices of gratitude can change a person. Listen, change a person drastically. He said five things come about when you practice gratitude. That gratitude, one, opens the door to more relationships. Two, gratitude improves mental health. Gratitude enhances empathy and reduces aggression. Grateful people sleep better. And gratitude improves Self-esteem. I know it sounds kind of basic and surface level, but implementing this type of practice could literally change your life. And that is just the world's perspective. God's perspective and what we see in his word has such a deeper meaning towards it. And so the study concludes, and I think you and I can agree that the quote-unquote happiest people in this focus group aren't the ones who have the best of everything, but make the best of everything that they already have. So on top of that, this is another man named A.J. Jacobs, and he's just known as this non-Christian American author and journalist. And he writes this book called um, Living a Whole Year Biblically, and it's pretty self-explanatory. He decides to take a, a journey and adventure and live one whole year living out exactly what the Bible has taught him. And out of that, a pretty important quote came out of it that's actually been quoted quite often. And he says this. He says, one of the big life-changing lessons that still stays with me is a sense of gratitude. And that's because the Bible tells us to say prayers of thanksgiving all the time. So I would say dozens and hundreds a day, like I would press the button and say thanks for the elevator coming and then be thankful that the elevator didn't plummet when I got on it. It was a strange way to live, but also wonderful. But I did have to say, that how many things go right is there. If that alone had been the lesson, that would have been enough. And that's kind of like the, the base level of gratitude. Now, you and I know this. For those who call themselves a Christ followers, for those who call the project home, like being thankful and being grateful for the, the things God provides you, that's elementary things. Now, I got two tables here. So who remembers here being at... Uh, um, at the kitty table when you were a child. Anyone here at the kitty table when you were a child? It was kind of like being at the bottom of the totem pole here and kind of the level ground of hierarchy, mainly at like, you know, Thanksgiving and family reunions. And I remember like I was growing up in like Ottawa, so all my family from Montreal and Toronto came over and this is kind of like the kitty table. This is where, um, um, you know, stuff happened. And you think to yourself, like, I want, we all had this like kind of vision, like, oh, why can't I be? Um, at the adult table, like, I'm, I'm a man now. I'm like, no, Reuben, like, you're six. Like, there's no point in you being there. But honestly, when you were at the kitty table, it wasn't because of a hierarchy. You were just, you were just young and dumb. That's who you were. Just take it as it is. It's the truth. But at this place, this table and the kitty table, this is where you learn basic manners, okay? Like, things like, can I have more, please? May I be excused to go to the washroom? Thank you for the food, mom and dad. Like, this is where you learn all that kind of stuff, to learn to be a decent human being. It's in this section also of the Christianity and walk with Christ where you learn the fundamentals, the basics right here. Bottom baseline of gratitude is right here. 
And most of us in this room would think and look like, oh, that's just a kitty table. But some of us in this room can't even make it here. On this table, this is where we learn the basics of thankfulness through the story we read in Deuteronomy through Moses. Now, let's take a look at a verse here that's specific that I read to you guys tonight. It'll be on the screen right here. It says this. It says, when you've eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Now, what are two key words here that we see? Go to the next one. For the. For the. What's the point here? For the. That is the essential primary lesson Moses is trying to teach you. Thank you for the what? Well, for the provision. God is the provider of all things. And this is actually, you may not know this, this is actually quite mind-blowing to the Israelites because they're literally like spiritual toddlers here because this is the very first time that they're finally seeing God as a provider of all things. But this is fundamental for you and I in 2022. Let's practice. What are we thankful for? I'm thankful for the food in front of me. I'm thankful for the clothes on my back. I'm thankful for the Baltimore Ravens, who are currently in the lead right now. I'm not thankful for the Blue Jays. I'm just kidding. I should be thankful for them. But these are all basic, fundamental things. But there are still some times in the believer's life where we can't even appreciate the things right in front of you, the things that God has provided for you. We get so consumeristic in our thinking that it actually translates now to our spiritual living. We live in a society now where like Amazon Prime, Netflix, and Google are the dominating voices in our lives. And what is the common denominator in all of those things? It caters to you and only you. From shopping to binge watching to getting all the answers you need. And then all of a sudden that translates to like, oh, well, if I go to the project, or if I go to Hope City, like, what is it for me? And don't, don't get me wrong. God will be your provider according to his will, though. Not your will. And that's the counterintuitive thinking that Christians have that's compared towards the world. It's like, well, what about me? Well, my feelings and my emotions. Well, there's so many times in Scripture where God presents himself in the Bible as what? I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Multiple times, according to Old Testament language. What does that tell us? It tells us that God is not just the God of your little life. He's the God of ages. He's the God of generations. He sees a 10,000-foot view, and that's something we need to understand. But just like the Israelites here, they get sucked into this mindset that what was once a provision, thanks for the food, Mom and Dad, has now become more of a preference. And now they're just, they're just negotiating with God. But God is telling this country through Moses, hey, maybe you just don't need more stuff. Maybe you just need to appreciate the stuff you can have so you, you can fully enjoy the things you get in the future. Because if you keep searching for the next thing or the next church, there will always be some sort of a gap there and you will still feel left empty and off towards the side because you couldn't see the beauty and the mess in the first place. And Moses is telling his people, like, hey guys, like, we've got, we're about to go to the promised land full of milk and honey and pomegranates and fig trees and olive oil. And in that time, to that culture, that's luxurious. But you're not going to appreciate it because you haven't appreciated what was in front of you the entire time. But like I mentioned before, that's a preliminary lesson. I don't know about you. This is the kitty table. When you were at the kitty table, you always had your eye towards the adult table. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to sit at this table for the rest of my life. I don't want to be the type of Christian to only thank God for serving me. The project, it can't be filled with people, although we love you guys. And we'll cheer you on, but the project in itself, as it grows, can't just be filled with spiritual toddlers. We need people who will be grown up in the faith. And to distinguish the difference between the boys and girls to the men and women of God, we need to see another story. We need to see another character. And we need someone named David. David, 
um, here to illustrate our second point. Now, Moses is teaching us just the, the, the kiddie level of thankfulness and gratitude. That is there. He's teaching us thankfulness and provision. Thank you, God, for this. Thank you, God, for that. But that's just the base level. And trust me, you need that as a foundation to move on in your life. That's important. But with David, here's a couple things we know about him. We know that he grew up in the house of Jesse. We know that he was anointed to be king of Israel by a guy named Samuel. But as he was going towards the throne, we could tell and read through his story in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel that he lived quite a dysfunctional journey towards the throne. And all the messed up that he went through, in that, he always knew and always remembered where he came from. Through the pain and the hard times, he always knew how to go back towards God and thank him for what he has given him. David, through his, through his life, displays a more mature level of thankfulness and also teaches us how to live that way. See, thanking God for the things he gives you, friends, is not a mature thankfulness. That's just basic manners. That's just knowing how to be a decent human being. People who aren't even Christian, people who don't attend the project, can be thankful and grateful for the things that's right in front of them. See, Moses teaching us, like, hey, when he blesses you, remember him. Hey, when he blesses you, obey him. Hey, when he blesses you, please don't forget and obey his commands. But with David, this is what we see in Psalms 23. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me down, uh, lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Get this, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Through Psalm 23, we learn a very important lesson here. Check it out in, in verse 4. I think it's verse 4. This is what it says. It's going to be on that lady wall. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, what's the key two words here? Even though. Even though. That is the point that he's trying to make here. That's the kitty table. We understand that. And quite honestly, it's elementary. Moses teaches us how to be little kids, how to be decent human beings. But if you want to be, if you want to be a big boy or a big girl, man, woman in the faith, to be like that, Christ followers who tend to have a more mature faith are able and thrive to sit more at this table, even though. David teaches us that there's a time to weep, there's a time to laugh, there's a time to mourn. There's a time to dance. It's in the human DNA, but what goes beyond you, David mentions over and over again that it is well. It's a common language we use even in church and in worship songs. It is well. It is well in my soul. It is well in my spirit. Even though I'm, I have a broken heart, it is well. Even though some people have left my life, it is well. Even though I may not be thinking right or have this vicious cycle, it is well in my soul. Moses teaches us how to thank God for the provision, but David teaches us even though, even though I go through some rough stuff, even go through, I go through some hard times, I will still learn to trust you. That, my friends, that's the table where we trust God for the things that we can see. This, my friends, well, if you want to grow up, this is the table to trust God for the things you cannot see. Even though. Now the ball is in your court, friends. You have to decide. All we can do is champion and pray for you and, and, and cheer you on, but you have to decide, am I going to be the type of Christian where I'm going to trust God, where I can see the tangible, physical evidence? When you sit here, you can see his presence, but also in the presence of your enemies. As David mentions in the latter part, in the, last, in the last piece of scripture, you provide a table in the midst of my enemies. 
if you want to be a mature, elevated level of faith, if I, if I could say that. There's no hierarchy in the faith. But if you do want to grow in your spiritual maturity, then you're going to need to learn how to sit at this table while enemies are just staring at you. In verse 5, David clearly is out that this table isn't just for you and God, even though he's there. But you're not alone. There are other people there. So, can you, we can all, eat tab- uh, at a table with stuff provided towards us? Of course, it's easy to say thank, uh, say thank you, God, for that. But can you eat your dinner? Can you be thankful and look towards God's face in the presence of maybe of your insecurities, in the presence of your addiction, or when anxiety is just sitting right there, or when lust pulls up towards the table, when these different things are surrounding, surrounding you, can you still say, I love you, God, and I'll trust you? Can you still have the maturity to look and keep your eyes fixated on the prize, which is God himself? So what I also love about this passage here is that in New Testament language, Jesus clearly lays out that all of authority of heaven on earth has been given towards me and is now given towards you because Jesus, as he was resurrected, even though he's not here physically in this form, his spiritual form lives inside of you. So that tells me and you that we have the authority. We have the power to overcome what the Bible says are enemies. As a matter of fact, God describes how the enemies, because you have authority over them, the enemies are the ones serving you your food. And that's just like a picture and a metaphor that David is trying to illustrate here. But when I learn to trust God, when I learn to have that confidence, I don't have only confidence to eat, but my thought patterns is the one serving me my appetizer. And my confusion is serving me my entree. And my fear and worry, well, they're now serving me my dessert. That's the picture David's David's trying to illustrate here. But let me tell you something. I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it, guys. But man, wouldn't it be awesome to have, just to live life out where at one point the enemies, whatever they may be, You can think of many. Wouldn't it be awesome to live out your life that at one point the enemies were coming towards you, coming towards you and attacking you, but now they're just waiters at your table. We have the authority through Christ to love him and trust him and be able to thank him, not only when your life is going well, but maybe when your life is not going too well. How much? That, that's, that's extreme. That's far-fetched. How awesome. How much of a rock-solid faith and thankfulness you need to have in your life to say, hey, in my young adult years, where everyone in this life or everyone around me or at school or my workplace, where everyone's being swayed by worldviews, by mental health issues and fears and worries, that we can stand here on a rock-solid faith, not willing to move or back down because we trust in the God whose presence and purpose is right in front of us. But don't get me wrong. They could all very well be there. And that, again, that's what David's illustrating here. These enemies have names towards them, and they're different for every other person. And I'm, and I'm telling you, I get it. Mental health issues, fear and worry, you can't take a pill for it. It doesn't just disappear. What I'm trying to say is that they won't derail your life, what God has planned for you. You are still valid. You are still free. You are still called um, a son and a daughter of God. But the question I want to ask you is, can you say that about yourself? Thank you for, and I was practicing this week, thank you for my church. Thank you for the project. Thank you for you guys. Even though I get to speak here once in a while on stage, you honestly inspire me so much. I was talking to a few people at Denny's last week, and I was like, man, some of the people here at the project. Whew. I'm excited for the project. I'm, I'm excited for you guys. Because you guys aren't afraid to grow up. 
You guys aren't afraid to step out and be a little bit un uh, uncomfortable with your faith. I'm thankful for, of course, my marriage. I'm thankful for, obviously, my house. But I'm thankful for God even though my, my family is breaking apart. I'm thankful for God even though my thought pattern is always trying to get the best of me and always trying to sabotage me. I thank God even though sometimes I'm fearful. I feel underqualified to be a pastor here. What does it look like for you guys? But all I'm saying at the end of this is like, hey, we got the best thing on our side. We got the best thing driving us forward. And that is the Spirit of God. And if you're here for the very first time, if you're here checking out the project or checking out church in general, hey, this is a safe place for you just to really experiment, experimenting that, to try it out, to process and pick apart. And in a second here, we're going to go into some worship, but for those who call the project home, can I challenge you and encourage you? We're going to sing a, a newer song tonight, but it is such an appropriate response to the things that comes towards us, whether they're good or whether they're bad. Our response should always be in praise, be in worship. Being thankful is not an emotion. It's not a feeling. Being thankful is actually a choice. And if we want to mature up, if we want to grow up in our faith, then whatever comes your way, how are you going to react towards it? Am I going to throw a little tamper tantrum over to the side? Or am I going to say, hey, this week sucked. But God, I choose. I choose to trust you because you have the best for me. Even though my future looks unknown, even though my future looks dark, even though I don't know what, what I can see right in front of me, you always go before me. And that is the beauty of you, friends, for those who are even exploring Christianity, that God is a God that not only loves you, but knows what's ahead of you. And he will bring you through hard times sometimes, but he brings them for the reason. And no matter what you go through, there's still validity on, uh, validity on your life. There's still purpose on your life. And he's willing to hold your hand through everything that you go through. So at this moment, I'm going to invite you to stand with me right now, and I want to pray over you. But I'm, I'm going to pray, and then the band's going to take it to just go into some worship. But when we worship, hey, like, guys, can we just thank him? And I know it's kind of, like, fundamental and preliminary and kind of basic and childish, but, hey, Lord, this is why I thank you. This is how I thank you. This is what I'm thankful for, for the good and for the bad. And I'm saying that not only for, oh, this is what we should do. I'm saying that also for you. That I know that when I kind of prepared this message, I was kind of practicing this, and I realized like my tone changed, my attitude, my spirit changed. And my prayer for you, no matter who you are, whether you've had a great week or an awful week, that you would leave this church a changed person in your mindset, in your perspective, in your heart, because God is a real God here wanting to meet with you tonight. So Jesus, we thank you for our moments. We thank you for opportunities like this, and we give you everything. We commit those kind of like mountaintop moments. The mountaintop moments where it's going great, it's going awesome, but also the valleys where it is dark, lonely, we feel scared, we know in those two situations, God, you are there, you are present. And so we trust you in those moments. We trust that you will come through. We trust that you will hold our hand through every step of the way. And for those in this room right now who are just having a, just a great week, we thank you for that. But those in this room who are having a tough time, maybe home life is breaking apart. Maybe school and midterms are becoming overwhelming. Maybe friends aren't truly friends. God, I pray for them. I pray for the stuff that they're going through, that you would just equip them, that you would remind them that you are the Lord and God of their lives, and that you truly care and love them. So as we worship, may we give praise, not because it's something we do, but because you deserve it. And so, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.